Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. Just a quick addendum. Somebody recently pointed out I haven't shielded my merch store in a while, and there is new stock there, so this is me doing that. If you wish to buy some merchandise, such as hoodies, flags, and shirts, then please check out the store in the description down below. There will be new designs coming in the future, and I will announce them as well. Anyways, back to the fiction. A School for Emperors, written by Discord Wow. Pinnacle Interspecies Preparatory School, Main Administrative Building. Of all things I expect to see outside my window in the morning. The last one is an alien news crew. Chancellor MacArthur, can we get a comment? On what? I replied. One of the aliens, helpfully explained. The Vorian Empire just withdrew all of their forces. They're calling for peace with Earth and an end to the blood feud. Even though I knew, tears of joy still welled up in my eyes. This is great. It is amazing. My family gave their souls to get me out of the occupation. And now, I can see them. The camera crew look awkwardly at each other. You didn't have to be a xeno-empath to guess what they were thinking. Finally, one of them asked the question I knew was coming. Chancellor, you were the private tutor of the Vorian Emperor. He mentioned you by name. Can you tell us about that? I straightened my tie. Oh, you must mean Mikey. Well... That was a very long time ago, and I wasn't his private tutor. He didn't have one. He went to PIPS, and I was his resident advisor. Yeah, let me tell you all about it, starting from the beginning. Memories of Henry MacArthur Back then, humans living off Earth was much rarer, and mostly concentrated in a few cities and refugee camps. I was one of the lucky ones. What was left of my family's fortunes had bought me a one-way ticket on a freighter, and I had managed to talk my way into a job taming animals for the gypsy circus. They had this quasi-sapient local carnival named Molly that looked like a giant wildebeest with fangs. As the Death World Animal Man, I would go out and uh, tame her live. Of course, the whole thing was an act, but the audience ate it up. Especially the finale where Molly would pounce on me from behind while I took a bow. It was a pretty good, carefree life. At least until an old friend of my family contacted me out of the blue. He'd gotten a job at the Pinnacle Interspecies Preparatory School, better known as Pips. Which was just as pretentious as it sounds. Private school for aliens. Apparently, he was doing great as a sort of residential assistant, so well that they wanted to hire more humans. Their offer was triple what I was making as the animal man, so I hung up my loincloth for a formal suit. It was barely a month into being a glorified babysitter that Mikey, <clears throat> sorry, um, at the time he was Mike and, uh, seventh child of Sir N, eternal god emperor of all Vorians. I stopped talking for a moment as I remembered what happened next. What the frack are you doing? A tentacled something or the other had latched onto my leg and was doing its level best to knock me down. I took a step back in shock but didn't let go. I reached down to separate us and the next thing I remember I was lying on the floor. Looking up, as much larger tentacled something or the other held a gun to my head. The next day, Mikan came to offer an apology. Teacher, Henry MacArthur, I'm sorry for hitting you earlier. And just like that, he handed me some money. It's all right, I would have handed the money back, but it was nearly a year's wages. Why did you do it? Father says that all the humans are our enemy, and that's what a blood feud means. So I had to attack you. So you're a Vorian. Well, for what it's worth, I got nothing against you. You don't? Nah, I guess I should. But the whole reason I left Earth in the first place was because of the war. 
no point in letting it follow me here. I was naive at the time. I didn't realize the only reason the big alien bodyguard didn't kill me right then and there was that the Emperor, Sir N, had personally ordered him to protect Mikan above all else. Surrounded by aliens, I had begun to think of myself part of a great cosmopolitan throng, rather than being part of humanity. But I couldn't escape myself. After that, I didn't see Mikan until a month later, when I got a noise complaint call. Somebody was throwing a loud party. I do the usual, where I open the door and tell him to keep it down. I'm just about done when I see Mikan. At this time, he's brought a second bodyguard. He looks at me. So, uh, Mr. R.A., are you going to do something about it? I looked back. I just did. I told them to keep it down. And why do they keep being loud? What then? I noticed that, while the music was still playing, the room had gone quiet. Then I'll stay here until the party's over. I'm sure they can keep the noise to an acceptable level in my presence. Mikan's face clouds, and I can tell he's planning something. Can we join then? Of course you can, sir. Student parties are open to all students. Your friends, however, will have to stay in the common areas unless they can show me a student ID. I've never seen an alien go from gloating to shock to anger so fast. But I'm a prince. They come with me everywhere. He looked at his guards, about to say something. I wedged my boot into the door, blocking the space as best as I could. I didn't make the rules. It's just the school's policy. Look. You have three options. One, you get violent. Two, you leave. Three, you call the provost right now and complain. To my surprise, he actually did it. To my even greater surprise, the provost showed up in the flesh, all 500 pounds of tentacles and cartilage, and ordered everyone back to the rooms under threat of immediate expulsion. I got a meeting with him the next day, expecting to get fired. He instead congratulated me. Apparently, Mikan had gotten into a spat with the brat who was hosting the party and was spoiling for a fight. My quick thinking had prevented a diplomatic crisis. After that, I guess Mikan figured that if he couldn't beat me as an enemy, then he'd have to become my friend, because he started trying to butt me up. He was a little annoying, but I wasn't that bothered, especially once I started calling him Mikey. Out of all the conversations we had, there were only a couple that I really remember. Hey, Mikey, can you help me with this assignment? I was auditing an introductory literature class. What? They don't teach you that to you? He seemed surprised. No, I grew up before first contact. Never knew any of this existed. I had been six months since the dorm room incident, and the powers that be wanted to give me a promotion so I could glad had rich parents. Of course... That meant that I had to be cultured. You mean, uh, you never read Galden's Three Dreams? Nope. Oh, I grew up reading Shakespeare, which was twice as dry as this, but at least it had some dirty jokes. What's it about? Kings, love, death, feuding families. So, um, it's the same stuff? Yes. What's Vorian literature about? Emperors, sex, blood feuds? Sounds pretty similar to me. Mikey pretty much walked me through the whole thing. To this day, I love Vorian literature, but I still don't understand it very well. In the end, it didn't matter. The parents didn't want to grill me about how cultured I was. They just wanted to hear adventure stories from the Death World Animal Man. Tough enough to thrive in the brutal Howl world, he's more beast than man. Had he tamed the savage carnivores that your over-blighted offspring... The only preparation that mattered was memorizing everyone's names beforehand, along with some info about their children were doing. I guess they donated a lot of money though, because I went from being some kind of bullcrap junior associate dean to full dean in a matter of months. It wasn't until a week before Mikey's graduation that we talked about the war. By then, I was dean of students and had a schedule all my time in advance, but I could tell that he had something that he really wanted to say. So, what happened with the war? I want to hear it from you, Mikey asked. Well, it's a long story. You see, uh, Earth used to be a pretty nasty place. Then it got nicer, and we set up rules about warfare. One of those was that you don't hurt civilians. Another was that you don't assassinate your enemy's leaders. 
You probably wouldn't believe it, but right before we discovered FTL, there were some who thought that the war itself would end. I paused to take a deep breath and keep myself from crying. And then we became fair game for every galactic jerk. The Drax got there first and killed maybe seven out of every ten humans in the orbital bombardment before enslaving the rest. And then the Kolokar arrived. You've never seen her celebration. Turns out that they had an agenda too. Instead of using us as slaves, they wanted us to fight their wars for them. I paused. Well, one of those wars was against the Vorians. We didn't know a lot about you, but we knew that you were a monarchy. So, some kid hijacks a freighter and ran straight into the royal palace. He thought he'd end the whole thing right there. Mikey looked stunned. You knew nothing of the blood feud? No. How could we? I replied. We looked at each other for a long time, and that was it. Mikey graduated and returned home to his father's palace on the high wall. That was ten years ago. Well, okay, there was a few other things, but I wasn't going to talk about them. A lot of things happened since then. I became Chancellor for Pips and the concept of human school, meaning an academy taught entirely by humans came into vogue. The iron bonds on Earth had begun to weaken, and although my homeworld was still a coloco colony, the average human was far better off thanks to diplomatic pressures from the Galactic Council and a few trade agreements that made us more valuable free than in chains. And then Sir N died, and Mikey became the new Emperor. I learned about it from the newspaper. Sir N, the eternal God Emperor of all Vorians, had been slowly dying for years but looked about to bite it. The crown prince was having one final night of debauchery with his childhood companions when he rammed his sports skimmer straight into an illegal asteroid miner that was parked in the wrong place at the wrong time. Splat! Neither the best intergalactic medical science nor the ritual torture of the captain, crew, and companions could bring him back, although the latter presumably made some Vorians feel better. Normally, succession would have gone to the second son, Tucker N. But a miracle occurred. Surrounded by his royal courtiers, the censor and Sir N willed himself to life. On the verge of death, he had a vision of his ancestors who commanded that the seventh son, Mike N, become the emperor instead. And then he died, conveniently beyond the reach of any cross-examination. The other children protested, of course, but they couldn't do anything to stop Mike N's coronation. So when Mikey's first act of foreign policy, eternal god emperor of all Vorians, was to end the blood feud with humanity, the rumors started flying. Hence the news crews. Pernicle Interspecies Preparatory School, Main Administration Building. Chancellor, what do you have to say about this? Another reporter shoved a piece of paper in my face. Human Propaganda School, reads the headline. I skimmed through it. It's pretty impressive. Somebody's gone on to note exactly how many Pips graduates have gone on to be executives, diplomats, and thought leaders, and then taken explicit pro-human positions. I can't help but feel proud, even if that's the last thing I want to show. All I see here is an advertisement. Pedicle graduates go on to be heads of state, business leaders, and artistic geniuses. Your article mentions the shipping mogul Rupenda Nabaranch. He's signed hundreds of trade deals with as many different species, yet he cherry-picks a single agreement with Earth and makes it seem far more lopsided than it is. One of the reporters asked the question they're all thinking, but um, the Vorian War, the blood feud, tell me that that's not a coincidence. I sigh and lean in, making sure that every camera can pick up my words. You do realize that the Vorian home system is off-limits to all non-Vorians. Do you seriously think that this was the work of human agents? Or maybe, as he's dying, Sir N realizes that this blood feud has been a colossal waste of time. And chooses the son that he knows will end it. Mike N could have gone to Stellaris Academy or the Lumvuk Institute, and it would have been the same. One of the reporters tries to interrupt, but I raise my volume and talk over him. And as this piece of propaganda, I pause for effect. 
It's a work of the bunch of vile, vicious, craven bastards who think that their blood feud is somehow justified, and that humanity deserves the hatred that's been heaped upon us because of it. Shame on you. Shame on you for seeing the genocide and thinking that it is somehow right and proper. That's all. No more questions. Now, you excuse me, I have a school to run. Imperial Palace, High of All, nine years prior. Mikan powered down the quantum relay. Henry MacArthur's face remained frozen, then faded. Henry had offered to help, of course. Coach him on what to say, how to act. Mikan had seen it many times, how the otherwise ordinary human was able to bend others to his will without trying. The irony of the situation was not lost on Mikan which was why he had to do this alone. What kind of emperor would he be if he was totally dependent on an outsider's help? He remembered the techniques that Henry had taught him, the extra-secret classes on human-style politics. Focus. What state did he want an ascent to the throne? What would a world where he won look like? Well, all of his oldest siblings would be dead. Focus. What would Henry do? Henry would probably just waltz in and sweet-talk his siblings into stepping aside. Could he do this? No. Bocus. Would it be possible to take the throne with his siblings alive? Maybe. What did having the throne mean, anyway? Henry always said that reality was what everyone believed. Could he make them believe that he was the rightful emperor? Maybe. Focus. Who can make that decision? His father, maybe. Could he convince his father to break the rules of succession? Probably not. All of his siblings were trying to. What could throw off the rules of succession? There was an entire court. Sycophants and administrators and secretaries and assistants and concubines and cooks and doctors. All running to and fro about the palace. Could he seduce the concubines into a focus? Who held the power? What did they want? And then he remembered that Henry had given him a final parting gift. A book written in Old Vorian. Mikan opened up his bag, and there it was. The Unbroken Chain. A quasi-confessional diary written by an old court eunuch. Why ancient history? Henry had alighted a few passages. Upon the death of the Eternal Empress Shan Vak Enar, I ordered that the wise Emperor Talvak En be elevated, as a firstborn Mike Enna was both weak and foolish. A priest Pequan Chal, I believe, was present. My concern was relieved when he read at the Arguis and found his course of action to be especially favored by the gods. The second passage, much later. The wisdom of Talvak Or and the matters both spiritual and temporal cannot be denied. The priests were the squabbling over who would become the high pontiff when Talvak N intervened directly, finding the junior priest Quick Conchal had shown exceptional wisdom and would become a new high pontiff. On the next page, Mike N found a handwritten note from Henry. This was cross reference with the Epicene text. I can't remember the name, but it's an interesting perspective, and you should look it up. When Mikan found the book in question, he realized that Henry hadn't simply named it. An epicene scholar with an unpronounceable name had written a text that would have gotten any Vorian author and his family executed for heresy. But here it was, hiding in the Xeno history section of the Great Vorian Library. Usurpers and pretenders. A cross species analysis of the subversion of patrilineal succession. While his rivals were off gaining favor in battle, Talvak N had bribed half of the royal court and intimidated the other half. Thus, when Sean Vok Enna died, the council simply proclaimed him emperor and arrested his brothers and sisters. So, it was possible, even for the seventh son. Talvak N, after all, was twelfth in line. With the plan in mind, execution was easy. All Mike N had to do was convince his brother, Tucker N, that the only way he could be emperor was to arrange for the death of the crowd prince. And it was just a matter of playing nice with the court while all the other younger brothers played their own games and took their own favorites. 
As long as everyone there knew that, were Mike and to take power, he would allow his father's court to keep their jobs, and more importantly, their lives. Maybe a few large promotions to those wise enough to see where the wind was blowing and take charge, but there would be no purges for the disloyal. Even his enemies would be given a safe, generous retirement, provided they didn't struggle too hard. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.